So the first question I'm usually asked when people are looking at detectors, and I mentioned the scintillator, is why scintillators? Um, what's the advantage of going with something like this rather than a traditional ion chamber um, or, or a diode? Um, and really, the, the heart of the matter is the water equivalents. Um, because we can make these out of water equivalent um, or organic scintillating materials and, um, or, and water equivalent plastics, we're not actually perturbing the beam right there at the, the point of measurement, um, which greatly simplifies all of the correction factors that, that go into that conversion between the, the measured signal um, and the dose that's delivered to the device. We can make them very small um, so that you can have uh, very high precision um, with the, um, the integration of your measurement, the, the volume averaging the area over which you're integrating signal um, is very small. Um, they show no dose rate or dose dependencies uh, for standard megavoltage beams, so that it's easy to use them across the board um, for the various dose rates. Energies as well, um, they've been showing energy independence. Um, not surprising because of the water equivalents again, um, but not showing any energy dependencies that would need to be corrected for. And because of all of those now, um, there are publications showing the beam quality um, correction factor of unity, again, making that uh, um, correction for small fields so much simpler. Um, there is a very small temperature dependence. It's about a, a tenth of a percent per degree Celsius. So for as long as you're just doing QA measurements at room temperature-ish, you know, close to room temperature, um, you won't have to correct for any temperature dependence. Um, and someday when we get into um, potentially patient measurements or something like that, um, which we are not currently FDA cleared for, um, there may need to be corrections between, say, skim temperature and, and room temperature measurements. Um, but just for the QA purpose, Purposes that it's designed for that that can be ignored. Um, the other nice thing about these scintillators is that there aren't any ferrous materials in the scintillator itself or, or the optical fiber and so it's easy to use it with an MR LINAC. Um, you need to keep the electrometer or the electronics um, out of the five gauss line but the the simulation fiber is just fine within the magnetic field. So general overview how scintillators work. Um, I know some people know this, but it has it has kind of surprised me how um, how important it is that we that uh, users actually really understand how the device works um, in order to really feel comfortable using it. So um, the the scintillation material that we use is a one millimeter diameter, um, three millimeter long active region for the W1 and uh, either three or one by one, depending which fiber you're using for the W2. Um, the ionizing radiation interacts with that uh, scintillator to create visible light. Um, and that is uh, transferred using in total internal reflection uh, down an optical transfer fiber, which we actually use PMMA, again, because of uh, near water equivalents. Um, the one difficulty with scintillators then is that because we're looking at visible light, we have to be concerned with the Cherenkov signal that is produced within this optical transfer fiber. So that's this kind of characteristic blue glow you see in a reactor coolant pool. Um, but it's uh, light, visible light that's produced by electrons traveling um, faster than the speed of light in the medium. Um, it's a, essentially a, a light shock wave, if you would, um, relative or in comparison with, say, a, a, a sound shock wave for a supersonic jet. But that manifests as a stem effect signal um, and is something that can be removed um, with the, the proper care um, in characterization of your scintillator. So we use a two-channel chromatic correction based on a publication from Matthew Guyot et al. in 2011. Um, and that was really the method that, that um, enabled um, bringing the scintillators to market because it, it was a nice, simple, straightforward, easy method um, for a user to go through in order to characterize the Cherenkov contribution um, and be able to correct for it in subsequent measurements. Now, scintillators are, um, are not uh, what we in the, in the calibration world refer to as absolute dosimeters. It's not something that, um, that you can send off to the calibration lab um, and have it ex and expect that it will be um, holding its calibration for two years like we, we do with our ion chambers. Um, it's a little more like a diode in that it will um, decrease in its signal as it accumulates dose, um, as it degrades over time. Uh oh, I'm say, hearing no, seeing no sound from somebody. 
Um, hopefully you guys are hearing me. If you can't hear me, please. Oh, good. Somebody can hear me. Thanks, Ashley. Um, <laughs> it might be sound on the other person's end. Um, as the material accumulates those it discolors um, I, I think all of us have seen old PMMA phantoms that used to be clear and now are, are kind of a, a grungy yellow color um, because we're looking at visible light it really matters uh, it affects the measurement how the light is filtered as it passes through that optical transfer fiber and changing the color of the optical transfer fiber as that plastic ages changes the shape of the spectrum that's transmitted through. And so you occasionally need to recalibrate um, both for the decrease in signal and for the slight shift in the spectrum um, to be able to uh, correct properly for the Cherenkov light. This two-channel chromatic correction that we use um, essentially splits our scintillation signal up into two sections. We call it the blue region and the, the green region of the spectrum. Uh, it's not a, a precise blue and green split, uh, <laughs> but, but that's uh, the, the general buckets that we're putting this into. Um, our scintillator is a blue scintillator. Um, and yes, there is a little more Cherenkov in the blue spectrum than in the green, but the, the scintillator being focused in that blue region and the Cherenkov being a more broad uh, spectrum contaminating signal um, lets us use a, a change in signal in the green channel um, to compared to the change in signal in the blue channel for two different measurement conditions um, to determine a, a correction factor, which we call the Cherenkov light ratio. Um, that can be used to, to correct later measurements to remove Cherenkov. So the, the process that's used for that um, is that you would give an, an irradiation um, in, with the optical fiber in two separate configurations. The first one is called, uh, we refer to as the minimum fiber configuration, um, where you would have the fiber coming straight out of the field. Um, either in this water tank holder here, it would come straight out, or in the, the um, virtual water slabs that we have for the W1. And then the maximum fiber configuration puts a whole bunch more fiber in the field, either wrapping it around in, again in the slab or in that water tank holder, um, in order to increase the Cherenkov contribution while keeping the dose to the scintillator itself the same. Um, and so then we look at the change in the, the Cherenkov contribution within the blue channel relative to the green channel, um, and that gets us this Cherenkov light ratio correction factor. That correction factor then is used for later um, uh, correction of, of measurements where you, you don't know <laughs> the Cherenkov, obviously, um, but by taking that green signal multiplied by the Cherenkov light ratio, subtracting that from the blue signal removes the Cherenkov from the blue, uh, blue channel, and that gives you your, your actual measured scintillation signal. If you'd like your output in terms of dose instead of collected charge, um, then you can perform a dose calibration. Essentially, once you've done this CLR measurement, you would deliver a known dose to the scintillator in your reference field size at a reference depth, um, and then let the system know uh, what that depth is. We can calculate a, a essentially it's a unit conversion, um, but a, a calibration factor that will convert that simulation signal um, back to dose. So the W1 was our first generation device. It was released in 2014. Um, as I mentioned, it does have a one millimeter diameter and three millimeter long active region at the end of the fiber. Um, because it's been on the market that long, there are numerous publications available. Um, one of my favorites um, is that the joint publication from the AAPM and the IAEA on small field dosimetry, which is the, the technical report series for 83, um, lists the W1 KQ factor as unity in every single table that it shows up in. Um, and this really does um, back up that uh, knowledge of the water equivalence of the detector, that even as the field sizes are decreasing, you're blocking your source, you're, create, you're changing scatter conditions, the spectrum of your field is changing, um, other detectors respond differently um, within those conditions, um, the scintillator does not require those additional corrections. Um, the, some limitations of the W1 is that um, it was designed just to be a single point measurement system. So looking at things like output factors specifically, um, it does also require a two channel electrometer such as our supermax electrometer um, to perform the Cherenkov subtraction. Um, we have uh, 
uh, routines built into the Supermax to walk you through the characterization um, and then uh, save, you know, save those characterization files um, and choose the one you'd like to use when you're making your later measurements so that it will automatically do the, the um, Cherenkov correction and give you your measured output in a, a much, much simpler format. The second generation device was the, is the W2. Um, this one was designed with water tank scanning in mind. Um, so with the W1, the optical fiber is connected directly to the, um, the signal processing optics. And the blue channel and green channel signals then are the ones that are analyzed um, via the, the dual channel electrometer. With the W2, we have combined the optics and the electronics into a single dedicated electrometer or signal processing unit, we sometimes call it, um, which is the Max SD. Um, the advantage of the Max SD is now you, we can have user replaceable fibers. Um, so if you, if you <laughs> happened yesterday, trip on the fiber and, and kink it, break it, whatever it happens to be, um, your grad student rolls the cart over it and damages it. Um, it's, it's much easier for you to replace the fiber, um, but it also gives you those options that you can use either a one by three active area in order to compare with all of the publications of the W1 um, or direct measurements comparison if you own the W1. Um, it also gives you a higher signal strength, so your signal to noise is a little bit better. But you also have the option of the very high resolution one by one millimeter detector for those extremely small fields when the resolution is is much more critical and you're willing to take a little bit more time in order to overcome signal to noise, particularly with water tank scanning. Um, the Max SD will allow you to do the characterization measurements and point those measurements with this unit itself. Um, it has a web based interface for controlling it that that makes it extremely easy. Um, but if you want to use it with your water tank scanning system, after you've done the Cherenkov uh, characterization, you can connect the um, output of the Max SD, the Triax output, from, um, into the input of your water tank electrometer. Um, and the Max SD will, will take every 10 millisecond integration from the scintillator, it will do the Cherenkov correction. Um, convert that into an analog output, a current output, and, and send that to the water tank. So from the, the perspective of the water tank, it, it really looks like a diode. You're not applying bias to it, but when the, the, um, the device is irradiated, the water tank electrometer receives a current. So the setup looks a little like this. Um, we have a sleeve adapter for the W2 um, so that you don't have to try and clamp down on this little tiny scintillator uh, fiber um, or optical fiber and, and worry about damaging it. Um, there's a, a small set screw here and, and just a, um, a larger diameter sleeve that will fit in a standard um, scanning ion chamber holder for any water tank. Um, it will fit both seven millimeter diameter and eight millimeter diameter holders. Um, that signal then is processed by the Max SD and, and corrected signal transmitted to your water tank electrometer. Um, we even have a, a jig that was designed specifically for the water tank for doing your CLR measurements in a, a slightly smaller field than we had uh, recommended with the W1 with the larger slab. Um, this will all fit within a 10 by 10 field, um, or you can do it with a, a six centimeter diameter cyber knife cone. Um, it's possible to, um, to do that characterization for a, a number of different types of machines. A little bit of uh, proof in the pudding, I guess, the, the data from the W2 um, initially before release, um, there was a study done with um, one of the beta units at uh, NYU Langone, so um, Indra Das's group at that time. Um, so this is a, a plot from their publication showing one by one centimeter fields, profiles measured in water. Um, the the uh, stars are the W2 measurements, and then the smaller dots are the radiochromic film. Um, so you can see we got excellent results uh, between comparing the W2 with film for scanning these really, really small fields, um, especially resolution in the penumbra region. Um, that was that was gratifying, as was the the um, signal levels in the tails. 
which is tough to get um, accurate uh, with other detectors. Um, they didn't see dose rate dependence up to the 2400 mu per minute that they tested um, or dose dependence between the, the very small irradiation of one centigrade up to 4000. Um, so we didn't expect differences from the W1. It was exactly the same fiber, um, exactly the same construction and, and the same sort of analysis methods. Um, but it, it is definitely gratifying to see the, the data itself. Another study that was done with the W2 um, came out of Richard Popple's group um, at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and they were looking at patient-specific treatments for um, variant hyperarc treatments with targets down to three millimeter diameter targets, uh, which was the smallest target evaluated, um, and the, comparing the W2 with um, radiochromic film measurements again for those those patients um, and got excellent results um, between the w2 and film um, in fact the the variation was more due to the the variation in the film analysis than uh, the w2 variations um, i like the the images that i'm showing here that came from um, that same group the the w1 being or w2 either one in this case w2 sorry um, being water equivalent you see a, a water uh, equivalent plastic plug from a lung phantom uh, like our SDVP and the, the tip of the scintillator is very hard to make out. You can kind of see a tiny bit where there's a junction in the, the construction or, or in that um, milled out spot for the, the scintillator. So we do provide a localization marker with a BB um, at the point of the, the active measurement point of the simulator um, to help with localization, to help with phantom planning if you're doing end-to-end -end testing. Because once you have a water equivalent detector, you can no longer pick it out uh, from your phantom image. Kevin asks if there are any issues with leakage current. Um, no, not really. I, the, the advantage of the MaxSD is because everything is um, compact, there we were able to minimize both the, the electronic noise um, and leakage, uh, but you can obviously need to zero the device as well. Um, keep an eye on it. If, if you do see leakage or larger leakage amounts, then, then yes, so we want to take a look at it. But no, we have not had major issues with leakage currents. With no more questions coming in, I'm going to close the webinar, but wanted to say thank you once again for attending. Thank you for your attention, and we look forward to talking to you again in the future.